All right, act it this morning, okay? <laughs> goals. Title of my message this morning is goals. What are your goals? Right before, it's kind of funny. Sometimes you just have something to hit you. I knew that I'd be preaching this morning right after I got back from council. And uh, I had not had, I had kind of wanted to prepare a message before I had left and had not had that opportunity to happen. And that morning, as we were waiting to get onto the plane, a meme had caught my eye. And it said this, 10 brutal truths about life that will help you get your stuff together. 10 brutal truths about life that will help you get your stuff together. And the first thing was, without goals, life is pointless. Without goals, life is pointless. And you know, sometimes in those moments, God just speaks. And he spoke to my heart, and I just began uh, researching on my phone, because I've got all my software on my phone. I began researching on my phone, and God just gave me a message there in that moment that I actually wrote on the plane, and stuff that I want to share with you this morning. I believe it's a message he really wants us to pay some attention to. Maybe it might seem simple, but I think there are some real truths in there, because it's true. If you don't have goals in life, your life is aimless, isn't it? It's pointless. If you don't have goals, you have no direction. You can stand there and stare at the mountain all day long, but if you don't have the goal of getting to the top of it, you're never going to climb the mountain, are you? You're just going to look at it all day long. We need to have goals. Now, Einstein said, there's a quote that if you'd bring it up, William. Einstein said, if you want to live a happy life, tie it to a goal, not people or things. If you want to live a happy life, tie it to a goal, not to people or things. You know, Einstein was partially right. He might have been a brilliant, intelligent man, but he didn't have it all together in this quote. He did have it right. If you want to have a happy life, you're going to need to tie it to a goal. I agree with that statement. If you want to have fulfillment in where your life is going, you need to tie your life into a goal. But he says not to people or things, and that's half right. Now, people will always disappoint us. They will always fail us. They will always reject us, and they will even hurt us. Even in marriages, people feel hurt. People have times of disappointment. People have times of failed expectation. People are people. They're human. They're not perfect. So if your goal in life is tied strictly to people, you could be setting yourself up for some great devastation. Likewise, if you tie your goal to things, I want to buy this, I want to attain that, I, 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 want, I want to possess this item, whether that's a house or a camper or a new car or, or um, a, a trip somewhere, whatever it might be. You can tie the things, but once you've attained that thing, you're going to quickly find out that that thing you've attained doesn't really have meaning. It might have momentary pleasure. It might have momentary purpose. But chances are you're going to become a slave to that thing trying to maintain it, trying to protect it making sure that you're using it or making sure that you're, you're making it worth its while. However, there is one person, and this is where I differ with Einstein, there is one person that we can set our goals upon, that we can center our goals around, because this one person never fails, will never leave us or forsake us, will never cease to love us, always has our best interest at mind, And that person, I'm sure you're confident, you know who I'm talking about, is Jesus Christ. You see, I agree that our goals in life, if we're going to have goals, we need to set spiritual goals. Now, some people take, and they'll set some spiritual goals, and they're like, oh, I want to read my Bible more, I want to pray more, I want to do this. Okay, those are good spiritual goals, but I want to talk about some serious goals that have an effect for eternity. Okay, are you listening to me this morning? And if... We don't make these goals the first priority in our life. You see, a lot of times our goals are still based on those people and those things, and we give them more priority than we give to the spiritual goals. Then we're never going to really feel truly fulfilled. But if you want to experience that true blessing in life, because you know that word in the Bible says, blessed are you? You know the Beatitudes when it says, blessed are you if you do this? It means happy are you. Well, you know what? You'll find blessing if you have spiritual goals. So I want us to look to this word, because it's the only place to find real spiritual goals, right? And I want us to look at five spiritual goals this morning. The first four feed into the last one. I want us to look at five spiritual goals that God inspired in his word through Paul to us as the church. Are you ready? 
The first, write it down. If you're taking note, write this down. If you got your phone, take out your little notes on your phone. Type these down because I want you to take note of these. These are goals given in Scripture that we need to apply to our lives. So our life won't be pointless. The first, to know Christ. To know Christ. Oh, pastor, that's so simple. I know Jesus. I'm saved. I gave my heart to Jesus. Yep. And how much do you know him? You see, a lot of Christians have incidental or accidental opportunity or incidental or accidental encounters with Jesus. They have an incidental encounter every week when they come to church on Sunday. They have an accidental bump up with Jesus when when something in the week happens that might be a little spiritual and it kind of surprises them. A lot of people kind of run into Jesus but are not running for him. Are you catching what I'm saying? There's a big difference between running into Jesus and running after him. This week when that new superintendent was elected, he got up and he said, he's a very down earth person, he says, now I, I don't know most of you. Of course there's thousands of people in this room who just made this vote for this person. Of course he doesn't know us individually. And so, so he said, so if you run into me in the hall or something, say hi. Well, I was waiting, Kim, we were, at Wednesday night we were out there were college receptions and Kimberly had gone in to use the, the restroom and I was waiting out in the hallway and I saw him walking down the hallway. And one by one people were stopping up and introducing themselves to him and saying hi to him. I had the chance, I went, took a selfie with the new superintendent. I, I'm one of those, these guys, you know, they, they meet with presidents and other things like that. They, they, they have influence in our society. And I watched me, I told him, man, you're the new rock star around here. But you know what? That was an accidental, incidental occurrence. I probably won't meet with this guy maybe ever again in my entire life. I might not ever personally be with him. I'll come to know of him. I'll hear of what he's doing. I'll probably hear him speak at different events. I'll hear him preach the word of God. I'll know about him through different articles that will be in magazines and other things. But I'm never going to come to really know him. Are you catching what I'm saying? Now, some of you, if that's how your marriage is, if your marriage is incidental and accidental, then you need to work on it. Because I really believe that this word know, if we look at it, it really comes from that sense of that intimately knowing somebody. And Paul said that my goal is to know Christ. Philippians 3, 10 to 14. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. That's not an incidental occurrence. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection, or in some versions it says, I press on to possess that goal for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. You see, Paul's saying, (coughs) it's not enough to have just had an incidental encounter with Jesus. I need to get to know Him and know Him more. I want to know Him inside and out. I want to know Him frontwards and backwards. I want to know He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. What was that power? I want to encounter and experience that same power in my life. You see, we might just have this this casual acquaintance with Jesus. But Jesus doesn't want us to have a casual acquaintance with Him. He wants us to get to know Him like we know a husband or a wife. To have an intimacy, to have a knowledge of who they are. You know, I want to know what my wife is feeling. I want to know what she's thinking about. I want to know what her ambitions are. I want to know what makes her happy. So do I want to know Jesus. Are we just content with saying, oh yeah, I know about Jesus. I'm a Christian. Or do we want to press in to understand Him more? To know Him more. It's only going to happen in this. That's why the spiritual goal of reading the Bible more and praying more, that's going to help you do that. Going to church, that's all ways to help you do it. But the ultimate goal is to get to know Him. Do you know what it feels like to come into His presence? Do you know what it feels like to get down on your knees and feel the Spirit of God 
moving over your spirit and speaking into your life and talking to you. That when you read this word, to have it become illumination as you're reading that word, to have it speak personally into your life. These are ways that we come to know him and know him more. We need to make Jesus not incidental or accidental, but we need to make him intentional. Say that, intentional. Are we intentionally living our lives in pursuit of knowing him more? I remember through the years sometimes when I get together with family. And, you know, when you live apart from your family, you live miles away and stuff, you don't always get to see them as frequently. But they're always family when you get together. I remember often sitting around dinner tables and, you know, and, and my, my parents would be there and I know my parents. And my sister would be there and I, I, I still know my sister. You know, but then we'd have the next generation down, nephews and nieces and things. And I remember telling myself, you know, I don't want to just be an acquaintance to these people in my life. I want to know them. The only way, how am I going to do that? I, I have to stop and listen to them. I got to ask them questions. I got to have some discussion, some communication, so that way I can hear what they're saying. And, and hopefully they want to hear something that I'm saying, so we get to know not just about each other, but to really know who each other is. Because I realize I don't want just there to be this family relationship because we have the title family now, but I want to know them personally. So many people today, we want to meet that celebrity. We want to meet that hero. We want to meet that, that either that great politician or that great actor or that great athlete. But you know what? The king of the universe is knocking on your door saying, I want to know you too. Amen. We might never get to meet our favorite sports hero. We might never get to know our, our favorite athlete. And just like when I met the superintendent, the new superintendent of the Assemblies of God this past Wednesday night, just, just like when I met him, I'm never probably going to really get to know him that much personally. But the king of the universe knocks on my door every day and says, I want to know you and I want you to know me. I want you to know my heart. I want you to know my will for your life. I want you to know what pleases me. Which brings us to the next goal. After we know him and make that our first and utmost goal, we then must want our next goal to be to please him and not men. Who are we living our lives to please? Is it our spouse? Is it our employer? Is it ourself? Is it the praises and approval of men? What people will do for the praises and approval of men? What people will do to get people to notice them? To get people to look at them? To, to recognize them? Or to try and make somebody else happy? But in reality... Our goal cannot be to make other people happy. It needs to please Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9-10 says, So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please Him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. In other words... Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, our ultimate goal has to be to please Him. Above your spouse, above your employer, above your friends, above anyone on this earth. In Galatians 1.10, Paul writes, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. If pleasing people, can you bring that up, William? Galatians 1.10, do you have it? You don't. Can you sneak it in there? Add a slide real quick. Let me read it again. He says, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. Whose approval are we trying to win? If pleasing people were my goal, he says, I would not be Christ's servant. Wow. How much of our life is spent trying to please others? Trying to win others' approval. Trying to get other people's attention. When all along, when all along, the only one's approval we should be searching for is to live out our lives for an audience of one. That one being Jesus Christ. His love is perfect. His expectations are realistic because he empowers us to fulfill them. His plan is entirely with our interest and with our needs in his mind. So to live to please him 
means to really do what's best for us. Because no one cares as much about you, not your employer, not your spouse, not your kids. No one cares as much about you as Jesus does. So if you seek to please him in all that you do, then you're actually serving your own interests. How do we seek to please him? It's in this word. Oh, we fight it so much. We fight obeying this thing. We push it off. We, we try to, try to eh, maybe not in that area. I'll, I'll, I'll do this, but not that. When all along, God's saying, this is how we please him. We follow his word. We don't do what society says. You know, right now, if you want to serve Jesus and you want to please him, chances are you are going to contradict our society in a massive way. Our society is going further and further from God. They are criticizing Christianity in every greater way. But you know what? What I saw this week, I saw the reality. There is still a remnant of people in this nation who want to serve Jesus. They're not judgmental about other people and their choices. And we understand that people who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior are not going to be searching to please, to live for the audience of one. But for us, there are still a remnant of people who are saying, I want to please God above all else. It doesn't matter what society tells me is right. I want to seek to please Him. And how do we do that? Through this word. Paul, obviously I'm not, go back to it. Obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people. But of God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. If you're living to please other people, you're not going to be able to serve Christ effectively. So, there's two goals. Ready for the third? Oh, you're not ready, huh? You ready for the third? Yes. To love. And that's not talking about romantic love. But to love like Christ loved. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers will be filled with a love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. If you were in the New King James Version, it would say the purpose of my goal, or the goal of my instruction, is that all believers will be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. How do you get that pure heart and that clear conscience? It's by coming to Jesus Christ. What does he call us to? An unconditional love. How is that different from this world's love? This world only loves what benefits them. People in general only love what benefits them. When they look at love, they're looking at how am I being loved more than they're looking at how am I loving others. How is this person loving me? How is this person giving to me? And we look more at how we're being loved than how we are loving others. But this love that he's talking about here, and he's saying this love is above every other thing. In fact, in in 1 Corinthians 13, it's the chapter about what this love is all about, this unconditional love. It follows the gifts of the Spirit, the teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, the ministry gifts. And it's basically saying, look, you can have all these different things about doing things in the church and ministry and doing things right. But if you don't have love, you're a clanging symbol. You're not who I've called you to be. Jesus has called the church of Jesus Christ to be an example of his love on this earth. Amen. That love is an unconditional love, which means it puts up with everybody else's garbage. It's getting harder to love like that these days, isn't it? If you look around and all the things that are so... Everybody's filled with offenses, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Everybody's filled with offenses over something. But really what we're supposed to be doing... Is putting on the love of Christ. Now, something that's really important. It's real because we need to understand this. People, when we talk about love, everybody wants to tell you how you should love them or other people. But this love coming from a pure conscience and a, a, a clear conscience and a pure heart, really what it's talking about is looking at your own love that you're giving out. You can't look and say, you're not loving me the way you should be loving me. And your love isn't good enough for me. You should be be looking and say, am I loving this person the way I should be loving them? Because if you're looking at somebody else and how they're failing, I've got news for you. We're all human. And if my family's been doing this, um, the personnel, the Myers and Briggs personality test, for some reason while we're gone, we all went online and we're taking these and we're talking about all of our different personalities. 
my gosh, I'm getting this. There are so many different personalities in this world. Chances are someone's not going to love you the way you want to be loved because we're all so different. And we're going to do things that will offend each other or hurt each other. But God doesn't say, you point out those people because they're not loving the way they should be loving. They don't have a pure heart. They don't have a pure conscience. No, 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 no. no. See, look at yourself. Are you loving from a pure heart? Are you loving from a pure conscience? Is it your love unconditional? Is it love that you're offering to other people? Is it bearing all things, hoping all things, believing all things? Is it putting up with all things? Is your love not boasting of itself to others? Because that love that we find in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not for us to point a finger at someone else. It's to look at our own selves. And at the end of that chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The greatest, above hope, above faith, it's love. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Do you have it? All right, awesome. Let your love be your highest goal. Let your love be your highest goal. How are, do we make it a goal to love others? It's a lot easier said than done. It's a lot easier. We love to use those words. Oh, I love you. Love ya. <laughs> love, love. Little hearts on Facebook. It's a lot different when someone's offended you or someone hasn't performed the way you want them to perform or, or someone has said something you didn't want them to say. It's a lot different to then take that unconditional love that you're always wanting and give it to that person. Yet he's saying, Make, let love be your highest goal. Next. Moving on. This one's kind of an interesting one. Number four. To live a quiet life and mind my own business. Let one of your goals in life to be to live a quiet life and mind your own business. Let me read the scripture that goes with that first. First Thessalonians 4.11 says, make it your goal. That's pretty clear instruction, isn't it? Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. We live in the most interconnected day that the world has ever known. You can't do one thing before it can blow up and the entire world can know about it in a millisecond with the internet. Social media has changed the face of things. And we don't know what's true anymore and even what's not true anymore. But all I know is that we are so highly connected that everyone is up in everyone's business. If you sneeze wrong, the world will know about it. If you forgot to cover your mouth when you sneeze, everybody will know about it. Our thoughts, our actions, and behaviors are paraded on this thing, the internet, on this thing that we all have access to in our hands every day, getting updates constantly. I'm sure many of you, I know mine already gave me one update on what someone had to say to me. I didn't read it. I was preaching. But I saw it. Come on. How hard it is. To mind our own business. Yet we're told in Scripture, make it your goal. Does that mean we don't share life together? Not at all. What does he mean when he says, make it your goal, mind your own business? Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down for you. Everyone say this word. Linear. linear. Do you all know what linear means? A direct line. A direct line. Linear relationships. Linear interaction. It is so easy to pick up somebody else's offense. The most, the, the way the devil has always worked to, to destroy the work of the ministry and to break up the people of God and to break up marriages and to break up families and to break up churches and everything else is to get people into each other's business and trying to fix each other's problems. Can I tell you something? 
It is not your job to fix somebody else's problem. It is not your job to fix somebody else's offense. It is not your job to fix somebody else's business. Even if you're aware of it. If you're aware of it, you can empathize, you can sympathize, you can pray, but it's not your job to fix it. Because as soon as you begin setting yourself in somebody else's business, you're taking over for that person, and you're taking what was linear, and you're triangulating it now. And then we start building... I don't know. Trapezoids and everything else before we're done. And it's so easy... To get caught up in everybody else's needs. Oh, that person was offended by this. we got to go fix it for them so they won't feel offended. Okay, who is responsible for their own offenses? The person who's offended, correct? You don't have to take up somebody else's offense. In fact, Jesus was very clear about that. Jesus taught us that if you are offended by someone, you go directly to that person. We don't need to pick up other people's offenses and other people's problems, and other people's concerns, to fix it for them. And you don't need somebody else to pick up your offense and defend you. We are not called to be defenders of each other's desires, wants, and rights. We're called to actually have linear relationships. That's that's why Jesus said, go directly to a person who offends you, and talk to them. If that person's bothered you, it's not going to say be silent, just go to that person and make it right between you. The problem is people no longer have any linear linear relationships. We take our offenses and we blurt them all over Facebook. All over the next drive. And what happens? I'm guilty of it too. I've done it before myself. It comes back and bites us in the face. It comes back and hits us right between the eyes. We need to realize, and then we look at this, where Paul writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business. He's talking about, don't get caught up in all that other stuff. You stay linear. Because you know what? <laughs> okay. You know, I like reviews on Yelp, and I like reviews on the hotline and stuff like that. But you know, sometimes people can do a lot of damage. It's not even always, always the truth. You know, you just, you just never know what to believe. The only way you can really truly understand and experience something is to experience it for yourself. This past week, I went to a restaurant that had over a thousand reviews and had four and a half stars, and the food was yucky. That's nasty. I'm like, who's eating this stuff? It's gross. I had to find out for myself. Likewise, I've been to places where people say, ah, oh, it's bad. And I've gone, this is amazing. What are you talking about? You have to experience people and things, other ones, on a direct relationship and not take up everybody else's view and effects. But have linear relationships. Mind your own. Make it your goal to lead a quiet life and mind your own business. Can you imagine how much more peaceful the world would be if we didn't pick up others' offenses? If we didn't feel like it was our job to defend everybody else? I mean, come on. How many of you have families with drama in them? If you're not raising your hand, I don't believe you. Because they all got some drama going on. Come on. Every family's dysfunctional. If your family's functional, then it must be dysfunctional because it should be dysfunctional. (laughs) Come on, it's people. But I've watched so much like petty, bitty, this, and you take this side, and I take that side, and I have to fix it for this sister, I have to fix it for that brother. No! Why don't we just do what this word says instead? Let's let's look at what Jesus taught. You have an offense? Go directly to that person. Your job is to take it up for everybody else. You're friendly, go directly to them. Talk to them directly so you can gain your brother. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Maybe you didn't hear it right. You could be jumping into things that you're not even sure about that are right. And that's why it's so important for us to mind our own business in those areas. And if we would do that in our relationships, in our families, in our churches, in our relationships, we'll all be a lot happier for it if we would just stay linear. These four things... To know Christ, to seek to please Christ, to love unconditionally as Christ loved us, to live a quiet life in my own business, it all leads to the fifth and final goal, which is so important, and that's to reach heaven. Anybody want to reach that goal? Anybody? Isn't that, isn't that our ultimate aim? To make it to heaven? 
Philippians 3.14 says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. He says, I preach on to reach the end of the race, to receive that prize, to reach the goal. To reach the goal to which he's called us to. It's all about, you know, earth is a preparation ground for heaven. Have you ever wondered why God sometimes, you see God do these mighty things in people's lives and then he takes them home? Because it got to that point where they were all ready to go. All shined up and ready to enter in. You know, we need to realize that we need to focus in this life and prepare ourselves for the next life. Because we're all going to have to live together in the next one. So you better learn how to love now. Because you're going to have to love these people forever in heaven. You can't go and say, God, I didn't want my mansion to be next to theirs. I wanted my mansion to be over there. Can't you move my mansion, please? No, because you're supposed to love one another. This is our preparation ground. We should be having the sight of eternity in our scope at all times. And when we're preparing for eternity, we need to edit what we're packing for our trip. You know, before we packed our bags and stuff, we looked and I'm like going, okay. I always love it when I go for a conference because it's like, how do you dress for this thing? It's like, you know, I I am so thankful. There used to be a day when I used to go to these councils and you had to bring your your, your suits and your ties and your shirts and all that other stuff. It's like, oh, good grief. Now it's like, do I wear shorts or jeans? And it's like, but but you gotta still often take sometimes take two different two different types of dress for different for even stuff. And you go through your stuff and you start editing your stuff. I don't really need this, you know. I, I went through, I packed all these things. I'm like, I can take five of these things out. I can take this out too. I don't need this. And you edit your back down. We need to be going through this life editing out the things of the world that God that we don't need to pack to take to heaven. Edit them out because we're preparing for that final and eternal trip to be in His presence. Amen. I want to conclude with these two thoughts. Galatians 3.3 3 says, How foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? After starting your lives in the Spirit, you're trying to reach your goals is what he's saying. Some versions of the Bible will actually say, Why are you trying to reach your goals by your own human effort? Realize that reaching any of these goals, you're not going to be able to do it in and of yourself. Philippians 4.13 says this. Would you bring it up, please? It says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That if Jesus is our strength, we can attain these goals not by our human effort, but by His effort in us. Because He is our strength, we can reach those goals and accomplish those things. It's not impossible for us to love the unlovely or to love in situations where we don't want to love. It's not impossible to be able to mind our own business about things. It's not impossible to really know Him and understand the depth of who Jesus is and have an intentional relationship. It's not impossible to please Christ. And Philippians 2.2 says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind, and by being of one mind and having the same goal. You see... God wants us to have the same purpose, the same mind, the same goal. As a church, to be united in our hearts. We need to have goals in life. Life is pointless without them. But let me tell you, before your goal of buying a house, before your goal of finding a spouse, before your goal of making a certain amount of money, before your goal of of traveling to a certain place, your first goals need to be spiritual goals. Intentionally wanting to know Him. Living to please Him. Learning to love His people. And not judging how other people are loving you, but how are you loving them. And minding our own business. Why? So we can each reach eternity. Would you bow your heads with me?